Hi, this is James Engel, Full Capital, and this is the March edition, March 2023 multifamily financing webinar uh, that we're going to go through. And I started with a picture of a Jenga uh, puzzle, and uh, I was playing this over the weekend with my kids. And Jenga is very tricky. You sort of got to shake, shake a piece, see if it's loose. And then if you think it's loose, you got to pull it out and put it back on top and not bring the whole thing down. So I think that's a little bit of what we're seeing in the market today is, um, you know, when we're talking to existing investors out there, um, some of the deals are going well and some of the deals feel like you've got one piece on there and uh, you just can't figure out that last piece. So we're going to we're going to walk through it uh, on this webinar and here's the agenda. So I'm calling this solving the puzzle. Uh, we're going to start with a $25 million case study and sort of walk through all the different scenarios that you as an owner should be thinking about. Um, number two, we're going to talk about sort of where federal funds is going. And third, we're going to really deep go deep dive into earnings calls. So I always like listening to maybe five or 10 earnings calls of people in the market. And then um, we're going to talk about where the opportunities are in today's market, and then how to finance those opportunities. So um, let's jump in here. All right, so $25 million deal. Um, let's say you bought it in 2021. NOI was a million dollars. Okay, good. Uh, you paid a 4% cap, so you paid $25 million. And you got a bridge loan, 80% uh, purchase price, 100% of rehab. We assumed rehab at $1.5 million here. And so at the time, you know, interest rates was three and a half. So you had positive leverage. You bought on a four cap. The interest rate was three and a half. And there really wasn't any forecasted um, SOFR growth. And so you were good to go. In a while, we covered, you had net cash flow. And assuming you used the 1.5 million in CapEx to really grow the NOI. And so over the next two years, let's say you grew the NOI from a million to 1.2. So pretty good growth, 20% um, growth. Um, and now you're sitting here in 2023 and you're like, James, I got this bridge loan. Um, maybe I had an interest rate cap and now it's expiring. My bridge loan's coming up. James, let me just refi to Fannie Freddie, or let's just sell the asset. And so let's go into the agency refi. So agency refi, 10-year treasury has moved up. Um, you know, at the beginning of February, it was five and a half. And now sort of at the beginning of March, it's close to six. But for this example, uh, we're going to plug in five and a half as the interest rate that you need to hit, because um, that seems to be sort of the um, midpoint that we've seen over the last couple months. And so right now, you would need an NOI of $1.8 million to refinance your $21.5 million loan. So you started at a million, now you need to get to $1.8 million to refinance out your bridge loan at $21.5 so you need an 80% increase in growth um, to refinance out. So that's in this middle column. And if based on your existing NOI of 1.2, if you need to pay down the loan, so you had $21.5 million loan, and you can currently qualify for a $14.2 million loan. So that is a $7.3 million loan pay down. So in these two scenarios, um, you know, it just doesn't work. Right. So you just haven't grown NOI enough. Interest rates have risen up too much. It just doesn't work at this scenario. So you're like, um, all right, I, I don't have I don't have 7.3 million to pay down. Um, let's go to next option. Next option really is, all right, can I just sell this deal right now? And at 1.2 million, I see deals getting valued um two ways. One is just on a cap rate basis, on a replacement cost. And so 1.2 million at 5%, you could sell it for maybe $24.2 million right now, depending on how much upside there are in rents, things like that, how much CapEx needs to be done. But then that would be a loss of about 800,000 on your original equity of 3.5 million. So not a great return. Um, actually, it's a bad return. You lost 20% of your money. Um, the other option that we see people valuing deals right now is, okay, based on today's agency loan, can I get 60% or 65% LTV at on, on this loan? So assuming a $14.2 million loan, somebody would pay you only $22 million. So based on 65%, that 
you would only get a $22 million value and you would lose a majority of your equity. So when you look at, I mean, I, it's not going to be perfect. Um, if you take a deal out right now, you're probably in this range, right? You're anywhere from 24 to 22 million. Let's just call it 23 million. You bought the deal for 25. So you're going to be out 2 million. You might lose half your equity right now. So the refi did not look good. Um, the sale didn't look good. So what's your other option? Another option is, all right, uh, let's just kick the can. Let's kick the can maybe two years and come up with another interest rate cap. Right. So the original loan that we did was floating SOFR plus three and a half, let's say. SOFR plus three and a half. I buy a 2% strike. So I cap my SOFR at 2%, even though currently it's closer to five. That cost me $1.2 million right now for a two year cap. Okay. So you're in 2023, you buy a two year cap. That 1.2 million, now you add that on to the amount of equity. So this, this equity might come from your general partner, it might come from a capital call from your LPs. It might come from a rescue capital fund. There's a lot of different places where this could come from. And so this is this is obviously going to increase your base. It's going to increase your equity in the deal, but it's going to give you two years, right? So it's going to give you two years to keep working on your business plan, to let the market heal a little bit. Um, so And so let's see what that does. All right. So as we've said in previous uh, webinars, last year's last month's webinar was survived to 25. So we get to 2025, we bought that interest rate cap. We've been able to grow the NOI and now we get to 1.6. So you're at 1.6 NOI and um, you know now you can qualify for an $18.75 million loan, which allows you to be pretty close, but not all the way there, right? So you still have that $21.5 million loan. So you're still short. Right. So you have a gap of $3 million. So you could get preferred equity or you could potentially get a MES. So on the right hand column, we say, all right, you get a fixed rate agency at 18.7. And then you also get a MES of 1.3 million. So the combination of those two, your gap is down to $1.3 million, which is pretty good. So this is going to give you that option of getting to there. And maybe today, you know, you bought the deal, improved the rents. And now you're already at the 1.6 million in this example. You've grown NOI and you can refi out and you're pretty close. We're doing a lot of these right here where, you know, 18.7 plus your MES piece. And then this gap is being um, put in by the um, sponsors or potentially from a capital call. All right. So let's say you don't have that money. Let's say you don't have um, this 1.3 million. Is there another option, right? So... The other option that we've seen on probably newer properties, so probably A and B properties in good locations, um, you have the same NOI, 1.6, and how do you get to a higher loan amount, right? So on this Fannie Freddie loan, you were at 18.7. How do you get to a $21 million loan? And this is through HUD. So we're doing some refis to HUD. The debt service coverage is lower, so you need a 118 instead of a 125. You need... Um, you can go off at 35 year AM, so your debt payment is lower. So you're at um, a $21 million loan amount, and now you need only 500000 to bridge that gap. So that's going to be more achievable from general partners. You know, you might have five general partners on the deal, each person throws in 100. That might be a way to solve this issue um, because you might not be able to refi. So by this time, you might be in the second. Uh, third extension on this deal. A lot of these deals were three plus one plus one. So three-year initial term, two one-year extensions. And now you might be into that third, second or third extension. You need to do something. So um, this refi to HUD is a, another thing that we're doing for a lot of clients to make sure that they get to 2025. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. It's going to take a little bit more time, but it's going to kick the can pretty far down the road because this is a 35-year fully amortizing loan with a step-down prepayment. All right. And if you make it to 2025, you might be saying, all right, it might be just time to sell this deal, right? So I've been in the deal for four years. Um, the original plan was five years. And at 1.6, assuming a 5.5% uh, cap, you can sell it for $29 million. So it actually uh, returns your equity, pay back the equity, and there's some money there um, left. So that's a pretty good return. If cap rates come down, right? It might go from five and a half to five. It would be even better. 
And another way to look at it is, can someone get 60% leverage on this deal, which would be about 31 million? In that case, you would even you know, get close to a 2X equity multiple. So this survive to 25 is not only for you to refi, but then also potentially the market to heal a little bit better, the fundamentals to be better, the economics, the we might be coming out of a recession. So there, there might be better um, rent growth prospects. So people are potentially going to buy at a lower cap. So that was sort of a, a summary here on the $25 million deal that you bought in 2021 and put a bridge loan on it. You know, some of these loan amounts are just for example's sake, but if you did take an 80% bridge plus some rehab, this is a pretty typical scenario of deals that were done in 21 and 22. And so some people on 21, they're having those interest rate cap calculate uh, expirations come up now. Whereas people who bought last year, they usually bought a two-year cap. So they're not going to expire until 2024. So um, as you go through this process, this is like a puzzle, right? You got to figure out how, what your shortage is, how, how you're going to get there so that you can move, move this deal uh, from 2023 to 2025. All right, so let's get into the forecast. Um, so every reading had been pretty good um, in terms of inflation. It kept coming down, 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 sort of from the peak of last summer. And then at the beginning, uh, in, sorry, in February, um, we saw a little bit of a pause or a little bit upward trend on some of the inflation readings. And so now uh, we're back on with a little bit more of an increase. People thought that maybe... February and then March, that was going to be the last hike. But now people are sort of baking in May, potentially June on 25 basis points, another 25 basis points. And so this is just delaying the pause, right? So I, most people don't think that 50 basis points is on the horizon. Most people are thinking 25 basis points and then really a pause at 525, five and a half. And then um, it's going to be up there for the rest of the year, it seems like. So um you know, I think the federal funds is important. Most people on the federal funds, the thing that this is driving is really um, the cost of your interest rate caps. So as they keep hiking, it just makes it more and more expensive on those interest rate caps, which is causing most of the issues right now. Um, most people think that they're going to cut. Um, it's just a question of when and how fast they cut um, on the backside. But all these deals are really based on 10-year treasury. So it might be based on seven-year treasury or five-year treasury for deals that are shorter term, but 10-year treasury is sort of um, where most deals are are priced at. And so we, we're seeing this floor of right around three and a half. And you know, at the beginning of the year, we started at three, nine, sort of middle of, let's say, end of January, beginning of February, we hit three and a half, 3.45. And a lot of people thought it was just going to keep going down. And they were afraid to sort of lock their rate. And now all of a sudden you wake up and it's back at four, essentially. Um, this chart was a little bit older. I think this was yesterday. But today it's already four. So it can move that quick. And so the range that most people are saying is around three and a half to four and a half. So if 10-year treasury is sitting around three and a half, you should probably lock your rate and figure it out and get out of, get out of your uh, floating rate deal if you can. So be in position to take advantage of any dips on the 10-year treasury. So that's what we're seeing on the, the federal fund side. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the market reports that I've been reading. Um, you know, Newmark puts out a pretty good report. And, you know, this, this talks really around the demand supply equation for multifamily in the next couple of years. So a lot of new constructions coming online. This is on a national basis. So we're not we're not going to absorb nearly what we saw um, in 2021. You already saw negative absorption in 2022 as a whole. And so really the next two years, it's going to be heavy on the supply side. And then hopefully by 2025, it's going to be back down. Uh, sales volume. I mean, 2022 actually ended up being pretty good, but a lot of that was sort of the front front half of the of the year. And then the second and a half just kept slowing down. I mean, Q1 is going to be even slower and 23, probably then Q4, just with the, the amount of increase in the interest rates. And, you know, this yield spread, the 10-year treasury versus cap rates, you know, you probably like to see that in the two to 300 basis points range. And right now we're at 100. So um, it is very tight and is pushing cap rates up, right? So if 10-year treasury is at 
people need to get paid a premium, right? So you see this Dallas cap rate in the fourth quarter was right at about 5%. And so that's that's probably right in the middle, right? You might have A stuff at four and a half, B stuff at five and a half, and then C stuff at maybe six, six and a half. Um, but all these are expanding by anywhere from 50 to 100 basis points, just depending on the market. All right, so... Um, you know, one of my hobbies is reading quarterly reports, reading transcripts of quarterly reports and listening to the calls. And so I pulled a couple that I thought um, had interesting commentary of what's going on or what they're seeing. So we're going to start with Candon. Candon is a publicly traded REIT. They own most of their assets in the Sun Belt. You know, in their commentary, they're talking about the bid ask spread. So this is what the buyers want to pay. And the sellers want to sell for and they it's super wide right now so that's why in, in the first quarter you're not seeing a lot of transactions and they're saying you know sellers are going to have to blink first so that goes back to the beginning right the case study that if you are in trouble if you have negative cash flow if you have an impending maturity you got to go right and so you've got to sell or kick the can all right second thing this affordability piece I thought was super interesting. So apartments remain more affordable than purchasing homes. So Camden is a class A, A minus operator. And here on the next slide, um, they talk about how many people moved out um, to purchase homes. So 13% in 2022 moved out to purchase homes. In January, it was just 10%. And then they're thinking it's going to go to 5 to 10% now, single digits on the move outs. So this affordability thing is real in terms of, yeah, rents have gone up, but then the affordability piece for single family homes has gone up even more. And so it's very difficult for people to purchase homes right now. And then they, ha they have a portfolio in Southern California. I thought that was, this was interesting. The difference between my physical occupancy, right? So let's say you have um, a 5% vacancy, 95% physical. And then your economic is typically how much you actually collect, right? So this could be bad debt, could be thing like that, things like that. In California, they have a 1,300 basis point or 13% uh, gap between physical and economic occupancy, which is just huge. Most of the time, it might be 4 or 5%. And uh, their example was people, the tenants smile as they live free and drive their BMWs and Teslas out in California. So for all those people out in California, let me know if that's true. Um, all right, let's keep going on Camden. So negative absorption. So we saw that chart from Newmark, uh, negative absorption overall for uh, 2022. But, you know, in the fourth quarter, it was even worse, right? So they had negative absorption of 115,000 units. And that was as bad as fourth quarter 2008. And then um, a lot of people, they just, they're just not seeing the demand on the apartment side. They just said, you know, a lot of people got a bunch of income, but a bunch of stimulus, and they're just not coming back to renew their leases. Uh, construction lending is down. Um, you know, overall, this, this piece around um, purchasing homes, I think, is very relevant for a Class A operator like Camden. All right, like MAA, um, so they are more probably in the A minus B space. And, you know, one of their things is that they are about 20% below new end products. So we see a lot of new supply coming on, but maybe one of those safe spots to be in is that A minus the B space where um, you just aren't, you're seeing a big, a larger gap between A and B and they're, they're not going to face as much pressure right now. Um, Marcus Melchap. You know, they had their sales drop, or they said sales in the market dropped about 57%. And then, um, and that was the lowest sales volume since 2011 on the fourth quarter. And then even the larger transactions right now are even more impacted since a lot of institutionals are down, pencils down right now. Uh, CBRE, they're saying cap rates are probably up 100 to 150, which is what we saw in Newmark. And then they're looking probably another 25 basis points before um, peaking. Blackstone, you know, their number one thing is pres pre preservation of capital. And, um, you know, I think they've gotten a little bit of slack. I think one of their REITs got a lot of redemptions. Um, but, you know, they're, they're on their call. They were, they were focused more on just uh, winning the war a little bit here. 
So instead of worrying about quarter to quarter, they really were focused in on sort of larger, um, I guess, larger bets, longer term thinking. So this is some of the things that they're focused in on logistics, rental housing, life science, office, hotels. I think that's life science office, not to be confused with just office in general. Um, and then Walker and Dunlop. So we'll spend a little bit more time on Walker and Dunlop. So Walker and Dunlop is a Fannie Freddie lender. Um, you know, they're thinking back half of 2023 is where they're going to see a lot more activity. Um, you know, and until I think the Fed stops raising, that's when they're seeing this transaction volume coming back in sort of the second half of the year. And then, um, you know, they're thinking all it takes is one or two more people, one or two big players to come in. And that's when everyone's going to start piling in. Arbor is another Fannie Freddie lender. Um, you know, they, they put out a lot of bridge loans. Um, they're going to try to convert those into agency loans. They're doing a lot of MES. So about 20 million in MES this past quarter. And, uh, you know, what we talked about on that $25 million deal, it's really laying on the MES on top of the agency loan. So the agency loan gets you to a 125 debt service. The MES is going to cost you about 13% in interest. And then that's going to get you to about a 110. And then, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of these um, higher interest costs are going to burn off or the caps are going to burn off. So they're going to have to do something. And, you know, a lot of people are wondering, what are these bridge lenders going to do? And a lot of these guys um, are going to have to support the loans because they just, they just, if they give up the keys on these deals to a Fannie Freddie lender, their career is pretty much done. And so I think right now it's going to be important to sort of work through these deals um, and find a solution, right? It goes, it goes back to sort of the Jenga puzzle. Um, you're going to have to shake every one of those blocks, every one of those corner pieces and see if you can find a way to get this done. And, uh, you know, remember that, you know, Arbor is a publicly traded company and they, they did not raise their dividend. And, you know, the, the analysts were like, Hey, how come you didn't raise your dividend? This, that you've raised it for like 10 quarters in a row. And they were just like, look, uh, we think it's more prudent to just sort of keep the money, um, on hand just in case to, to look at more opportunities. And so I think as an operator right now, that's probably the right thing to do, especially if you're in a floating rate loan. Until these interest rates cap comes down, you, if you're in a floating rate loan, you probably need to hold back on distributions for a little bit here. Um, so commercial commercial mortgage alert puts out sort of a weekly um, newsletter, and I thought this one was had some good stuff. Um, you know, they focused in on the macro uncertainty, and then nobody really knows where rates are going, so it's just a guess, especially with each print of CPI building on each other. Um, a lot of five-year loans are getting done, um, but you know I think a lot of people are trying to get um, sort of these warehouse lines set up, but there's just not enough transactions to get them done right now. And uh, I like this last sentence, the only dirty word out there right now is office. And so if you think it's bad in multifamily, it's even worse in office. So um you know, trying to get these deals done. I think there's plenty of capital for multifamily, but it's just figuring out at what cost and what structure to get these done. So um, we're going to work, we're going to wrap up with Berkshire. So Berkshire put out its annual report and, um, you know, they they really invest in two, two types of business, same way as a lot of people do in multifamily. There's the GP piece, right? Where they're hundred percent in control. There's the LP piece where, they're a passive owner, right? They don't uh, necessarily, but they just pick wonderful businesses at wonderful prices. So, um, you know, I think the same way that they have to look at the market and time the market to a certain extent, uh, when to buy pieces or buy investments, um, you, you're going to have to do that now, right? And so, um, you know, finding uh, properties with sort of long lasting, uh, favorable economic characteristics and trustworthy managers is going to be key if you're going to be passive right now. Um, some of the things that I, I thought were neat were some of the big wins that they had. You know, they don't make many uh, bets, but when they do make bets, they, they make big bets and they hold them for a long time. And, you know, a lot of the even people that invest along with Charlie uh, and Warren, 
you know, they don't look at every detail um, on every deal, but they have a ton of skin in the game. And so that's what Charlie and Warren are known for doing is treating their money well. And so a lot of investors come along with them and they have a ton of cash. I can't remember 150 billion or something like that in cash. Uh, so they don't really need to ever uh, feel like they're in a uncomfortable cash position. And your job as the CEO, as a GP, is to be the chief risk officer out there. So, um, you know, I think that's some of the takeaways from Berkshire um, from their annual letter this year. So we've gone through sort of the economic and multifamily side. So we're going to jump into the financing side. You know, um, my background, born and raised in Houston, went to school in Austin at UT and then BFD, been up here in DFW since 2006. You know, a lot of people, you know, going back to my time at G Capital, um, that was a time similar to this time where transactions slowed in 2008, 2009, 2010, and almost everyone became an asset manager compared to an underwriter because you weren't originating a lot of new loans. And so we had to look, work through a lot of different property types, a lot of different loans. Um, so I think our role is going to change a little bit. Our, our role is going to be, instead of originating as many new loans, um, on acquisitions, you're going to be sort of refinancing and recapitalizing a lot of deals right now. So um, so your job right now as an owner is to not become a forced seller. Um, you know, Neil Balwa recently, you know, and I think one of his podcasts, he was saying, uh, your job right now in 2023 is not to make a 2x or 3x return. Your job is to protect your principal. And to protect your principal the way that you do that is make sure you kick the can far enough down the road that you have you have time on your side. You're not becoming a forced seller um, in this market. So, I mean, we mentioned this earlier. I mean, why why is anyone even buying multifamily right now? Um, there's still a huge gap, right? When I talk to operators, they're still 95% occupied on their deals. And there's a huge premium to single family homes compared to multifamily. You know, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio is anywhere from seventeen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars on a monthly basis. Austin's three thousand dollars a month. So, I mean, there's just a huge. You need the down payment. You need to qualify for the loan, and the pricing is just way more. And so, I think apartments are still going to be a great place to be. And then, if you look at the migration patterns, I mean, Dallas or Dallas, Austin, Houston. You've got the Southeast. You've got Florida, and so there's still going to be a ton, a shortage of on the affordable side. You're going to have, um, you know, opportunity to purchase at better pricing. And then the lending is avail still available through Fannie Freddie. So where's the opportunity, right? For buyers, it's going to be motivated sellers on bridge. It's going to be loan assumptions um, that we've covered before. It's going to be um, Fannie Freddie floaters that have these big uh, replacement caps that are costing 5% of the loan amount. That's where the opportunity is going to be. Um, to come in and buy these deals uh, from sellers. So here we are on the different loan options that are available. You know, what's moved up? The bank loans are going to move up about 25 basis points every time the Fed moves. Freddie SBL has moved up with the 10-year treasury, so it's probably close to 6% now. Freddie and Fannie are still probably in that 55 to 575 range. Non-recourse bridge is close to 8 to 9% right now. Um. You know, the bank loans on deals, I would say smaller, probably one to five million. This is still achievable, but you're probably close to eight to nine percent. And for quicker approval, smaller deals, I think the bank loans still work. Uh Fannie and Freddie, I mean, super light in the first quarter. I mean, they did about four billion. They probably need to do um, I can't do the math in my head, but a lot more than that. So <laughs> On a they, they you know their goal is seventy eight billion a year. Um, so you know they're they're coming in pretty short right now. So um, this 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 is probably a lot of carryover from last year as well. So I think February and March are going to be light. So we're going to be looking. They're going to be looking to do more. Um, you know we're still doing a lot of Fannie Freddie business um, as people coming out of floating rate, people coming off a of bridge. Um, here's a deal that we helped on sort of a Fannie Freddie loan assumption, uh, fixed rate. I mean, these deals are still getting done. This was a seller that owned a deal for probably five or six years. 
and you know it had five or six years left on the loan and just you know it was time to sort of recapitalize the property and he was going to either do it or a um, new buyer could come in with new money and just sort of complete the the value add on this deal um, bridge lenders are still out there still calling us to do business um, really the debt yield has to be nine to ten percent just to refi out of these some of these loans um, this was a deal that we did um, smaller deal under 100 units here in, here in Irving has non-recourse sort of fixed rate around 8%, um, three years IO and higher leverage. So probably 70, close to 70%. And, you know, majority of the units were classic units. So you come in, finish the rehab and improve the overall and probably had about 150 in rent bump um, from there. But yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys are trying to get from bridge to agency and we're doing a lot more sort of 10-year fix, seven-year yield maintenance, or seven, five, or even five-year fix, three years yield maintenance right now um, to make up, um, to get to the fixed rate in the short term, but then also to not have a big prepayment penalty as well. Uh, this was a deal. So Bedford Creek, it was on a Freddie floater, and it was coming up on its three-year cap. And what we ended up doing was going to a fixed rate on seven year fixed at about five and a half with a five year yield maintenance. And so that allowed them to sell their existing rate cap, get all those escrows back and put like a million, a uh, million and a half back to the um, property level and not have any escrows on the rate cap side for the next five years or seven years. So they can sit there, hold the deal for three four years and then sell it and not have to worry about it. So, um, you know, the main thing on this is not taking too much leverage at the beginning. And then also they were able to drive NOI growth at this property over the last two or three years um, through COVID. So a lot of people ask, you know, why should I work with Pole Capital? I mean, I think this is a good um, chart that shows the volatility in the 10-year treasury and all the different options that people are using. So whether it's Fannie Freddie fixed, it's sort of starting in 2017, 18, and then it going to bridge and then going to floating and then going back to bridge and then now more into Fannie Freddie. Like you have to understand um, what's available at this point in the cycle and how to sort of work through those items. And so whether it's, you know, podcasts, whether it's our speaker series, Lunch and Learns, this webinar, um, all those types of things, we're going to help you sort of walk, walk you through the deal, quote deals, and make sure you're doing the right deal. And so we're representing you throughout the entire process. And then now what people are finding out is, hey, I might need a little help on this deal that we did, um, whether it's asset management, whether it's uh, loan servicing, like figuring those things out, that's what we're experts in. And so, um, you know, whether you are choosing are working on a deal, new deal or an existing deal, feel free to reach out to us at Old Capital. Uh, we were ranked number 18 out of 20 uh, top mortgage firms, mortgage banking firms out there for the last year. Uh, we did about 1.2 billion in loans in 2022. And then some of the events that we have coming up, uh, we're bringing JP Conklin at, in March um, in Grapevine. And then we're going to have a property and asset management panel um, April 26th. And then we have actually a more fun, fun event, uh, networking slash charity event um, called Strikeout Homelessness. So we, we previously had done basketball events. Now we switched over to bowling, had a few injuries last year. So um, keep it, hopefully no one gets injured this year um, at that at Strikeout Homelessness event. So I uh, appreciate everyone watching. Definitely subscribe to the channel, like, comment, share on this video if you found any of this interesting and um, you know maybe have any questions, let me know. If you are looking at a new deal, definitely reach out on a term sheet, whether it's send over T12, rent roll, OM, whisper price. And then if you're looking at a deal, I had a call with uh, you know probably 15 LPs last, uh, last month and we just walked through a couple of deals and sort of took questions from everybody and comments. And I thought that was pretty good. So if you're looking at a deal, uh, send it over to me. I'll take a look and give you any comments from there. And then if you're just getting started, um, you know, look at creating and completing a personal financial statement. And then we can go through, um, you know, next steps from there. And then at Old Capital, we're always looking at new hires and, you know, whether it's, you know, you got laid off from a job and you're looking at next steps of doing something else. 
uh, that's what happened to me, right? So G Capital, they 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 closed down the entire office, and I had six months to figure out what I wanted to do, and um, I came over to Old Capital. So, uh, you know, definitely reach out if you're interested, and uh, we can we can chat from there. So appreciate everyone watching, and uh, I'll see you next month.